this morning. I almost thought I was going to have a free day. Well, not really, because if I didn't come, I'd still have to do YouTube lectures. But I was like, almost, but it wasn't enough snow. But it was pretty, pretty day. All righty, get that going. Got the PowerPoint, got recording going. And get my notes. All righty. All right, Mr. Kushner. He's coming. Okay. All righty. So we're still talking about God. Um, now we're going to talk about how Jesus fits in to God. There he is, or at least there's a picture of him, an artist's representation of Jesus. All right, so where does Jesus fit into God? All right, because I want to start out first by emphasizing the fact that, you know, Christianity is monotheistic. It comes from Judaism, the early followers. Jesus was a Jew. The earliest followers of, of Jesus were Jews. Um, so how does this how does this figure in? Because Jesus, um, you know, they were they believed in one God, but they almost from the start, Jesus's followers have this intuition that he is somehow divine as well. How that works is, you know, do they have it 100 percent figured it out? Probably not. OK, there needs to be development. And it wouldn't it just wouldn't have occurred to them as monotheists that there could be more than one God. I mean, they knew that. There were religions that taught that, but they rejected that view specifically. Um, many biblical scholars, I say many biblical scholars who kind of uh, kind of adopt a skeptical view, um, would say that you know Jesus never called himself God or even thought of himself as God. That what happened was the early Christians just made it up as part of their belief in the resurrection. You know, that at the resurrection, Jesus was made into a God. And that's how they kind of explain the fact that very early on, you find Christians calling Jesus God. And if they were Jews, it just really wouldn't have popped into their minds to, to do this. It's a, it was a really um, an unusual development. Yes, Jesus, I mean, they could have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, but the Messiah was not a God figure. Remember, he's a king savior. So you could accept Jesus as the Messiah as a as an early as a Christian and not make him a god. You know, you could say he was glorified by God. He was raised up into heaven and, you know, uh, not a god per se, but God glorified him and uh, brought him up into his presence and stuff like that. Uh you don't have to make Jesus into a god necessarily. So where did this idea come from? And so more, you know, biblical scholars who are more skeptical would say, well, you know, the Christians just made it up. But it's equally plausible to argue that the idea of Jesus' godhood came from the follow their Jesus' followers' actual experience of him. And it developed in the same way that the idea of the, his messiahship, his messiahood had to develop. Okay. Um, in fact, you know, if we look at the Gospels, presuming they're historically accurate, but if we look at the, the Gospels, uh, in the Gospel of John, at least two times, two times in the Gospel of John, the Jewish crowds pick up stones to kill Jesus, to stone Jesus to death. Be why? Because they thought he was claiming divinity. They thought he was claiming divinity the prerogatives of God that only God had. And that was blasphemy and that was an offense against God. And the punishment for that was be, to be stoned to death. And so the crowds actually try to do try to stone Jesus. If we look at the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus is frequently opposed by the religious leaders 
because he arrogates, he takes on himself authority that only God has, like forgiving sins, which could only be done in God's temple, changing the law of Moses, which was given directly by God to Moses, so he can change God's law. He thinks he has the power to do that. Uh, and, you know, and it's not for nothing that it's, it's the religious leaders that oppose Jesus. They have religious issues with Jesus, not political issues necessarily, like if he was the Christ. You know, the Christ who's the king of Israel. They don't have necessarily an issue with that. It's not their issue that Jesus might be the Messiah. It's that Jesus is doing things in the religion that are offensive to them. And that's what starts getting him into trouble with the religious leaders. And in fact, we see these two interesting threads in the Gospels, these two interesting memories in the story of the Gospels. Why do the Romans kill Jesus? Well, the Romans kill Jesus because of his perceived political claim to be the Messiah. Pilate asks Jesus straight out, are you the king of the Jews? The charge on the cross says this is the king of the Jews. That's why he's being killed. So the political claim, the concern of the Romans is that Jesus makes this political claim to be the king, savior, the Messiah, the Christ. But there's another thread. The Jewish religious authorities want Jesus dead because of his perceived religious claim that he is divine, he's God's son, which could also be a title, I think I told you this, uh, the son of God could also be a title for the Messiah as well. The, the kings of Israel were sometimes called the sons of God. They were like adopted children of God. But Jesus seems to mean it more than that in the way he applies it to himself. So the fact that, um, the fact that, uh, so what do I think? I mean, I think that some scholars are too skeptical. I think that that might be one of the reasons Jesus did get into trouble or did cause controversy because he was more than just a reformer of Judaism. He was more than just a reform movement. What made Jesus unique and unusual was he was also making claims about himself that were offensive to the religious leadership such as, you know, I'm, I'm kind of God, you know, <laughs> which, which, you know, seem, which seemed to go back to Jesus himself. Because otherwise, if he's just another Jewish reformer, Jewish prophet, you know, there's not necessarily a reason to have him, that the religious authorities would want him killed. Maybe the Romans would want him killed if people were saying he was the Messiah and Jesus was saying he was the Messiah, which he kind of was in a, in a way. Um, but the religious claims, what's going on there? And I think there's, you know, it's it's not necessarily his followers just made up this idea um, that it probably does go back to Jesus. And that's what got him into controversy with the religious leadership, because he was making theological claims and not just political ones. So, we, but we do have to remember the early Christian followers did not understand fully either of these claims about the Messiah, the Messiah wasn't supposed to suffer and die. So that made no sense to them. They had to fit that into their views. And about God, since there were Jews, there was only one God, and that God is spiritual. He's not physical or material, so he couldn't become material in any way. So you have kind of like two issues there with Jesus. If Jesus is claiming divinity, then how does that not make a second God when there's only one God? That's a contradiction for the Jewish mind. But also, how could you, a man, you, Jesus, a man, be the spiritual God, God who is not physical or material? How could God actually become physical matter as a man? So that was another problem that didn't make any sense. Yet they knew in faith, in their faith, what they experienced, that Jesus was a man, and the greatest proof of that was that he died. <laughs> you know, Jesus suffered death like all human beings. So he was a human being, and he was both the Messiah and the God of Israel somehow. And the fact that the proof that he was the Messiah and the God of Israel, both these ideas, was the fact that he was risen from the dead. The, again, the resurrection, you can't underestimate the resurrection, this, this event of the resurrection. The resurrection changes everything for Jesus's followers. Okay, whatever they thought of Jesus before 
the resurrection, thought he might be a warrior, messiah, a prophet, a teacher, like a rabbi, just a holy man. All of this changes, even a failure because he was crucified, but all of this changes with the resurrection, the fact that he rose from the dead. Uh, okay. With the resurrection, the, the followers of Jesus could now say what they believed, but maybe weren't necessarily so sure about, like that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, remember when we talked about the papacy and I read, you know, Simon Peter. So out of all the 12 apostles, all of the 11 gave opinions that they gave opinions about who people thought Jesus was, but only one of them was courageous enough or had the faith enough to say, well, I think you're the Christ, which left the other 11 saying, what did they think? Apparently they didn't think enough to just shout it out and say, oh yeah, of course, Jesus, you're the Messiah. We all know that. <laughs> Why do you think we're following you? You know, no, it's one guy, Simon, and he's blessed by Jesus. It's such a kind of a superlative intuition or that, you know, Jesus, and Jesus says, you didn't even get that from yourself. You got it from God. God like inspired you to, to... <laughs> soda. Sorry. Oh no, I don't mind. It's all right. <laughs> um, what flavor? Ooh, actually Dr. Pepper, a lot of people think of Coca-Cola or Pepsi, but Dr. Pepper was actually the first soda or carbonated drink. I'm a traditionalist. <laughs> Anyways, I also don't like cocaine in my soda. So. <laughs> it's weird to think that like 100, 150 years ago, back in the 1800s, people were hepped up on a lot of drugs they didn't know about because they were dumping drugs into alcohol and coke and all sorts of things into, into our food. Anyways, um, but they not only could they say what they kind of believed, but maybe weren't necessarily sure about, but his followers could also say what have, would have actually been unthinkable for them as Jews before Jesus, namely that God became flesh. Let's see if I... Oh, okay. But the, but the ideas have to develop. And um, they do will develop. But before we get to that, you know, you're going to make some wrong turns. I mean, when you're developing anything, when you're developing something, sometimes things go straight. OK, and you wind up where you want to be. And other times things kind of go wonky. OK, and you have to bring them back and say, OK, no, this is this is the truth. And it's not it's the same thing in religion. People have to think about what they believe and sometimes you have imperfect ideas. You're kind of close to the mark of what you should believe, but maybe you're not. And that happens in Christianity too. So you have this idea of subordinationism. Okay, early Christians believed that Jesus was God, um, but they didn't know exactly how he was God. This is going to take a long, long time, several centuries to really figure out and, and at the end of the day, God is beyond my comprehension as a as a creature. So, I mean, we'll never have God fully figured out if you believe in God. That's what we mean by God is incomprehensible. It doesn't mean you can't understand God, but he can't be fully understood. Um, so early on, the view of Jesus and his relationship to the Father, to his who, the God he called his Father, was this idea of subordinationism. Jesus was divine but he was kind of le a lesser divine being than God the Father. And we can also throw the Holy Spirit in here as well, although some Christians weren't sure that the Holy Spirit in early on were not sure what to make of the Holy Spirit either. They weren't sure if the Holy Spirit was even God, um, but I throw it in here anyways. But if he was God, the Holy Spirit, then was certainly a lesser God than the Father for, for a lot of Christians. And that's how Christians operated for a long, long time. They had this subordinationist view. Jesus was God, but he was kind of a lesser God um, than the Father, who was the source of divinity. And I have this picture of the Son there because you'll sometimes, you know, in, in the early Christian discussions of God and the relationship of Jesus to God, they describe Jesus as kind of like being 
a ray of a ray of sunshine coming from the sun, light from light coming from light, and that's kind of how they describe the relationship of Jesus the Son to the Father. The Father was like the sun, S-U-N, all right, um, was kind of like the sun, and then Jesus and maybe the Holy Spirit were kind of like emanations coming out of the divine nature of God. They were also divine, but they were not exactly the same as the Father who was the source of the God. Okay, so, you know, light from light, okay? We'll come across this expression later. This might sound familiar. This terminology might sound familiar to you. So Christians, you know, thought this way for a long, long time. Um, they had these beliefs. They were not, when we look back on them with hindsight, we can say that they were imperfect beliefs. But again, they're trying to develop their understanding of the relationship. And a lot of times people just live out their faith without thinking about it. They're, they're going to church, they're praying, they're living their lives, and they're maybe not thinking through all the things they believe. If you ask them, is Jesus God? Say yes for the first two centuries, maybe three centuries of Christianity. Oh yes, Jesus is divine, he, he's God. But that it's just might be as far as it goes. They might not if you ask them further, like, oh, is he as fully God as the Father? Is he united with the Father? You know, they might say, no, he's not. They might even be shocked by that because it sounds like, you know, you're you're um, uh, denying the distinction between the Son and the Father in a way, um, which they might consider wrong. So you have to kind of get into the mindset of what was going on here. The church usually doesn't address questions until there's a problem. Okay, when we talk about the church councils, remember the church councils are part of sacred tradition. Um, and, uh, well, anyways. Um, and usually the church doesn't hold a council, a meeting of bishops, until there's a problem in the church. Something has to be decided, something major. And uh, this is what happens with the question of Jesus. Because all of the this, this issue of, Jesus' relationship to God the Father comes to a head by the 300s with a priest, a man named Arius. Look at the people in the next classroom, they're laughing. You're not supposed to laugh at school. It's not fun. <laughs> You're not supposed to be happy, Miss Cibarelli. You're supposed to be bored out of your mind. You're supposed to hate being here. Anyways, laughing in the classroom. Dear Lord, what will happen next? Learning. That's the problem. That's what I'm trying to avoid, Miss Spencer. Learning. Don't let that happen in my room, Mr. Kozlowski. <laughs> okay, so you can see the dates of this man, Arius. He was born sometime between 250 and 256 AD. He died in 336. Okay, he was a, a priest from Alexandria, which is in northern Egypt. And um, what do I want to say? He starts preaching that Jesus is a creature, that Jesus was made into a god. Um, he's God. He doesn't, again, he doesn't deny the divinity of Jesus, but Jesus is a lesser god than the Father. He is. Um, he has been actually been created. He's a creature. He's been created as a God by God the Father. He's been given Godhood by God the Father. Um, kind of like the angels who are also spiritual, who are spiritual beings like God. So Jesus was kind of like an angel in that sense, he, that he was created, but he was much more exalted. He was of a higher level because, of course, he was divine, whereas the angels aren't gods. Um, you know, so he's preaching these things and he gets in trouble with his bishop, who at the time was a man named Alex, St. Alexander of Alexandria. Okay, Alexander of Alexandria. And Alexander criticizes Arius for this, for teaching this, because it sounds wrong to him. But it's interesting that Arius' response is like, you know, from some of the, the literature we have, we, ha we do have some of the writings of Arius from this time. And, you know, his response to Alexander is like, you know, but, you know, Bishop Alexander, I'm just teaching what I've heard you teach. 
You know, so was Alexander teaching subordinationism as well? Was he assuming this position? And Arius, so Arius is like, I'm confused. I'm just teaching what I think I've heard you teach. And then now you're telling me this is not correct. So it might show that even St. Alexander didn't have it fully clear in his head. And when he started thinking about it, he's like, no, you know, this is, this is probably a wrong position. We shouldn't be teaching this. But anyways, Arius stressed the father's superiority and that only he assumed the subordinationist idea that only God the father was divine in the fullest sense because he had no beginning or origin. God the Father is the has no origin. He has no beginning in time. He is the source of Godhood um, for, for God in a way, because he is existence itself. He exists as God. And whereas the Son, by his name, God the Father, God the Son, Son implies that the Son has an origin in the Father, comes from the Father. And so to Arius's way of thinking, um, to say that, the, that you could not say that the son was uncreated and eternal then, because then he would be like God the Father, and he's not the same as God the Father, who alone is uncreated and eternal beyond space and time. Um, so in his mind, just thinking logically, he said, well, then the son must be different. He must be created. There must have been a period of time when he did not exist, and he was created in time by the Father. Because otherwise, in his mind, you have two, what you could say, unbegotten gods. You have two gods that um, have always existed with no beginning or origin. And to him, that made no logical sense. So the son was a creature. Arius never challenges that Jesus is truly divine. I mean, he even calls Jesus the perfect God. Which, again, you might say, well, isn't that a contradiction? How could it be perfect and yet he didn't always exist? Isn't that an imperfection to not exist, a deprivation or something? But nevertheless, he calls Jesus the perfect God. But Arius was teaching that the son was created as a lesser divinity than God. Only the father was alone God in the fullest sense. I just give you some terminology here on the PowerPoint. I don't know. I might test you on it so it's there, so you should be aware of it. Some of these terms come up, um, they talk about, and it will come up later when we talk about the creed that Nicaea gives us um, to describe. But to describe the relationship, how do you describe the relationship between the son and the father? It's, they, they use this terminology of begetting, the, son, the father begets the son, um, which is probably not the best term to use because it says to produce or procreate like a father. And God is not physical, so he doesn't have sexual organs. He also doesn't have a wife, so there's no mother goddess. Um, he doesn't have a wife to procreate with. So, you know, it's probably not the best term, but they're grasping at terms to use to describe the relationship. The fact that the father is the source, and is the source of the existence of the son, okay? But he's not created. The, the, he's generated is probably a better way to describe it, which is to produce something or bring something in the process of bringing into existence rather than creation, which is to make something. All right, Arius was saying that Jesus, the son, was created out of nothing at a period of person, at a point in time. But when you use words like, well, forget about beget for a moment here, but if you probably a better way to understand it is generation. Gener if God generates something and he always exists, then he's always doing it, whatever he's doing. So if God is generating the Son, producing the Son, the Son comes out of the Father in a way, in a manner of speaking. But it's always happening because God is existence itself. He's always existing. There's no so there's never a time when the Son is not being generated from the Father, and there never will be a time when he's not generated by the Father. So it's not a creation event, like when God creates the world, because that happens in time. There's a specific moment when the world does not exist, and according to the Bible, God speaks, and creation or the created world exists. That's why it's called the creator. It's made. Okay, but if you understand the principle that 
where Arius goes awry is thinking that thinking of it in terms of creation rather than generation. Okay, if you understand, uh, do you understand the principle? Is that clear, or am I making it clear? Because I want to. Okay, if God just to repeat it again, if God always exists and, and He's pure act, then whatever He does, He always does and always has done. From the beginning, from, there is no beginning or end with God. There's because He's beyond time. So, if the Son has always been has been generated from the Father, and we could apply this to the Holy Spirit as well, the Holy Spirit will come later. Right now, the question is about Jesus. Um, then it always happens, and this is what these Christians have to start thinking through. To Arius, this made no sense. This made no sense. He didn't understand the distinction. Um, but other Christians like Alexander, and especially this man, St. Athanasius, who will succeed Alexander, will have to think through these ideas and come up with this terminology, new terminology, because they weren't using these terms before, really, to talk about the relationships. So they have to figure these things out. Created versus generated. This is a uh, picture of Arius. Not, I mean, it's, it's from much later, so it's probably not how we look. We don't know how we look. But the St. Nicholas Church in Greece um, on an altar in this church. And uh, you kind of see who was the loser in this battle. <laughs> Who's going to be the loser in this argument? Because here he is being swallowed up by some beast and burning in hell. <laughs> you know, so, and he's dressed up like an Eastern Orthodox priest, but he's being eaten by some creature in the fires of hell. So kind of tells you uh, how Arius is going to end up. <laughs> Not good. So what did Arius mainly teach? Just to you know, quickly go over um, in specific what he was teaching and what were some of the problems that people had with him. Uh, we don't have, he wrote something called the Thalia, which is Greek for the banquet. Uh, and we don't have the whole work because usually when a person was deemed a heretic or teaching false teachings, a lot of times their writings got destroyed or people just didn't copy them anymore because they were her the heretical writings. So no one was interested in them or should have been interested in them. But we do have fragments of the Thalia that's quoted in other authors who are responding to what Arius is teaching. So we do have some idea of what he taught. And the first thing, as I already told you, he said the sun was a creature, albeit a perfect creature. The sun was made by God. The sun had a beginning in time. The son has no communion with the father because how could he? The father is perfect, perfect existence and perfect godhood. And Jesus is not because he was created in time. So there couldn't, following this through logically, there could be really no communion between the two. They were different. The son could change. The, there was changeableness in the son because he was a creature. He was not simple in that sense as God is. Um, who doesn't change. And he, and he came up with little jingles for his followers to it was kind of smart in this way. It was actually a good advertise, a good ad man for his points of view. He come up with these little slogans for his followers to say, to kind of summarize his thoughts. And, and they would use them as slogans. You know, the Aryan Christians would march down the streets and they would chant these things against the other Christians they disagreed with. Equal or like himself alone, he has none, God has none, nor anyone in glory. Or there was a time when he, meaning God the Son, was not, you know, meaning that he was created. There was a time when he was not God, he was created as God. So they would go and do the streets of Alexandria and chant these things. And then the, the other Christians who disagreed, who thought Jesus was fully God and always God, they had their own little jingles and slogans, and they would go through the streets and they would chant their slogans, and then the two would come together and they'd beat each other to <laughs> beat each other up. You know, good times, you know, those Christians, you know. <sighs> Love your neighbor. <laughs> So there's a problem, there's a controversy, and it's disturbing the whole church in the East. And you have even bishops 
who are supposed to be, you know, kind of the teachers of the faith uh, and protecting the authenticity of the faith, disagreeing amongst themselves. You had bishops who followed Arius, were Arian bishops and thought Arius was right. And you had other bishops who thought he was wrong. Um, and, it, and it shifted because there were times when there were more bishops who actually were Arians than were actually what would become the Orthodox teaching later on. Um, the popes of Rome were always anti-Arius. They did not just not agree with Arius, and nor did people like Saint Athanasius, who was exiled. He was kicked out by the Arians from his from Alexandria like five times. He spent more time outside of his diocese where he was bishop um, than than in it because the Arians would not allow him to assume the uh, the bishopric of Alexandria because he was not an Arian. He opposed Arius. So we're going to have to have a council. A meeting of the bishops to decide this. And this happens in 325 AD in a, a city called Nicaea. So let me just show you where it is. It's a modern day Turkey. Just outside of the modern city of Istanbul. You see Istanbul here. And uh, just outside in this region was the, the, the city of, um, maybe it was a village, but I'll say city, the city of Nicaea where they met. Um, and it was convoked by the emperor Constantine. I don't think I've mentioned, well, he's on the PowerPoint, but I don't think I went into detail about Constantine. Whoops. He's on the PowerPoint. Emperor Saint Constantine the Great, uh, who is uh, who was the, the emperor of the Roman Empire at the time? Um, I don't think I talked about him at all. But anyway, just briefly, he had become a Christian. He was the first Roman emperor to be to become a Christian, Constantine, and uh, they had his dates. I do have his dates. Hold on one second here. Let me read you. Two seventy two to three thirty seven. That's circa, right? Constantine lived circa two. Is my mind? Two seventy two to three thirty seven AD. And when did he become, I think, emperor in 306? I thought I wrote that down. I thought he became emperor in 306. Anyways, he, uh, he tried to become Roman emperor, I believe, in 306. He, could, he thought he was Roman emperor um, of the Western part of the Roman Empire. Um, and I can't go into all the history here. It's a little complicated, but the Roman Empire was devo divided up into two halves, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire. And each half had its own emperor. OK, uh, Constantine thought he was emperor of the West, um, at least to be acclaimed as such by his army. But there was another dude, another guy who decided he wanted to be, or he was emperor of the West. So they're gonna have to fight over it. And so Constantine marches down to Rome to, to, to meet this guy in battle who was claiming to be emperor of the West. Um, just so you know, he's a guy whose name was Maxentius. And so the story goes, there are different versions of the story, but you know, um, I'll go with the traditional one. So the story goes, before the battle, Constantine looked up in the sky and saw some astronomical event. We don't know what it was, you know, the explosion of a supernova, something, who knows, comet, who knows what he saw. What he thought he saw was the Christian symbol, the Cairo. He thought he saw this, which is called the Cairo. From the first two letters of Jesus's name in Greek, Christos in Greek, okay? 
and this is the chi, and this is the rho, okay, so ch and then r, and Christians would combine this. I mean, the cross, the cross becomes a symbol of Christianity later, but early on, the Christians didn't use the cross that much as the symbol. The, they use this, the two first letters, the chi rho, the two first letters of Jesus' name, Christos. That was their symbol. And that's what Constantine thinks he sees in the heavens, in the skies. And he thinks it's an, I mean, he's a pagan, he's not a Christian, and pagans are big on omens and signs. And he thinks this is a sign from the Christian God that he will win, that he will become, he'll defeat Maxentius and he'll win the battle and become the Roman, take his rightful place as the emperor of the West, which he does. Okay, it happens. So it's an historical event. And because of this, he thinks that, well, then the Christian God gave me the victory. That must be God then. So he becomes a Christian. He at least he becomes a believer in Christ. He actually wasn't baptized until he was on his deathbed, but that was not uncommon in those days. People usually put off baptism much later. But he becomes a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus in the Christian religion. Um, and he sees it, you know, he believes in it. He was sincere, but he also sees Christianity as a source of unity for the empire, something that can unite the empire as well. So when he travels over to the east, Egypt, where this controversy has been started by Arius and Bishop is Bishops are at the throat of other bishops over this issue. He sees this disunity. Constantine's like, we got to solve this. We've got to bring unity to the church because that's it's just bad, bad business, you might say. It's just bad for the empire. So we have to bring unity. So he's actually the one, Constantine, who calls this council. He you know, says, okay, knuckleheads, <laughs> we're, we're all going to come together and you are going to figure this out. So that's, he's the one who calls it. It was called with the approval of the current Pope of Rome, who was Pope Sylvester at the time, you know? You know, <laughs> suffer and succotash, we're gonna have a council. <laughs> the, any Looney Tunes fans? So, Sylvester the cat. The reference is lost, Miss Cibarelli. Yes. Miss Rarick, you with me? Okay. <laughs> Pope Sylvester at the time. So po Pope Sylvester doesn't come to the council. The popes never come to these councils. The popes are always too cool for school. You know, they're not going to travel all the way to Rome to the east. But they, he does send delegates who represent him at the council, and he approves of the council. Um, because of doing this and because of all the benefits that Constantine gave to Christianity um, after he became a Christian, he, he was canonized in the Eastern Church. The Eastern Church, that's why there's not the Western Church, interestingly enough, but in Eastern Christianity, he is considered a saint. Um, the Western Church never considered him a saint because they knew where the bodies were buried. <laughs> because they had to bury them for Constantine. Um, no, he seemed like he was a good man, but, you know, not a questionable in some ways. But, but for, just for some reason, he never became a saint in the West or in the Eastern Church because of his contributions. He's considered Saint Constantine the Great as well, sometimes called equal to the Apostles because of what he did. Um, so they hold this council of bishops, and Arius is there, and his supporters are there. Um... You know, the one of the main problems, you well, you know, you, you might just say, well, why not? Oh, wait, I did put it here. Excuse me. 306 to 307. So my date is correct. 306 is when he kind of became emperor. Um, you know, they couldn't appeal. You might just say, well, why not just appeal to the Bible? Look at the Bible. What did Jesus say about himself? How does it describe Jesus? Well, that couldn't, that wasn't determinative because each side had their own cater or group of scriptural texts they could appeal to, to contradict the other. Nothing, you know, there's nothing, just like with Jesus saying he's the Messiah, Jesus never comes out and forcefully says, okay, I'm the Messiah, nor does he ever define it. Um, but the same thing about divinity, he, he just acts the way he acts, and he never comes out, well, sometimes he does, like in the Gospel of John, but he never defines his relationship to God the Father, um, so, you know, scripture was not really very helpful in these matters. 
because both sides could claim scriptures and claim the other side was distorting. So they have to think about these things. They developed this idea of the universal council, the, the council, uh, a representative group of bishops of the church who would be the final authority in doctrinal crises when you have problems that need to be solved. This doesn't mean that it denies the unique role of the Pope of Rome because the Pope of Rome should be involved in all these councils. And they always wanted the Popes of Rome involved because of their status. Nicaea lasted only about two and a half months. About 318 bishops, mostly Eastern bishops, showed up for it. Constantine was there, he was present. And as I said, Sylvester was not, but he sent delegates. And it condemned Arius. The bishops came down on the side of uh, against Arius and on the side of people like St. Athanasius, who was Arius' bishop technically, and defined Jesus as possessing the fullness of divinity. Um, because fullness, you know, it didn't make any sense to say Jesus is fully God. Well, fully, if he possesses the fullness of divinity, then he's fully God, and he possesses all the attributes and characteristics that God has, such as eternity, meaning no beginning in time. Hence, so that plank of Arius's view goes out. The fact that he's not created, his existence itself, his, ex his essence is to exist, his essence and his existence are identical. That cuts out Arius's plank about, you know, there was a, a plank that he was a created God. Okay, because by definition, God is not created. That would mean he would have to receive his existence from something else, something transcending God that God's getting his existence from, and then that thing's God, really, at least God to God, in a way. So Arianism is condemned. It defined Jesus as possessing the fullness of divinity. He was of one, they had to specify specify that he was of one and the same divine essence or nature as the Father, Although begotten by God or generated by God from all eternity, so without beginning and certainly without end. The novelty of Nicaea was not just the fact that it happened. This was the first universal council in the history of Christianity, but also that it produced a creed. I think I have creed on here and uh, I think it's on the next slide. A statement of faith an official statement of faith, so everyone would know what the church believed. It, it wasn't enough for people to go home and say, okay, this is what we talked about, and let me just tell you. No, there, should, there needed to be an actual statement that they would all sign on to, all that agreed with it. Obviously, Arius wouldn't sign it because he didn't agree with it, nor the bishops who agreed with him. Um, but they wanted a statement of faith. And I should also mention the historical reality was that this didn't really solve anything in a way because Arianism continued for centuries after this. Uh, and, and there was a period of time after Nicaea where, as I said, most of the bishops, certainly in the Eastern part of the church were Arians, even after Nicaea, they simply rejected it. They wouldn't teach it. They wouldn't teach the teachings. And there were only a few that were were considered orthodox, okay? Uh, the popes of Rome were always on the side of Nicaea, um, but, you know, it, it existed for a while um, and took some time because even into like the 500s AD, 200 some years, maybe even 300 some years, the, uh, the Arians converted German tribes in Northern Europe and they were all Arians. <laughs> so the, the Western church had to deal with this even after Arianism itself finally died out because you had all these Germanic tribes who were heretical and con or considered at least the Western Christians heretical because they accepted Nicaea. And so that caused wars and stuff like that, um, problems eventually in the West. The problems of the East came over to the West. Um, so for example, you can find uh, in Italy, that, like in Ravenna, I mentioned Ravenna before, it was the capital of, of Rome, or capital of the Roman Empire, the Western Roman Empire at one point. You, you would have two churches. You would have the Nicene Church, the, the, the Catholic, which will be the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church that accepted Nicaea. And right next door, like right next to it, you'd have an Arian church. And they were almost indistinguishable. You couldn't, 
You could look at the pictures on the walls and stuff. You, know, you couldn't really tell. You know, they had pictures of Jesus and the saints and stuff and set up the same way. You couldn't tell. Probably in their prayers, you could tell the way they talked about Jesus and how they prayed. You could probably tell um, that they didn't, that there were some differences. This is an interesting picture. It's a picture of Arius, again, um, dressed, I mean, this is a much later picture. This comes after the time of Islam, so later on, um, this is, you know, Christian, Christians, when they drew Arius, they drew him like he was a Muslim, which he was not, he was a Christian. The Muslims didn't exist at this time. Muslim Islam comes from the seventh century, so 300 some years after Arius was long dead. Um, but because Muhammad, the founder of Islam, denied the Trinity, denied Jesus was God, kind of, or didn't, well, denied the Trinity, let's put it that way, just like kind of, kind of Arius did, even though he didn't kind of do that, he did still think Jesus was God. It just shows you how Christians misunderstood Islam, they didn't understand Muhammad. But anyways, um, they would depict Arius for his de apparent denial of Jesus as fully God. They, like Muhammad, they would depict Arius as a Muslim. So he's wearing a turban and Arabic dress, uh, Arab, uh, yeah, Arabic dress. Anyways, even at the Council of Nicaea, this is obviously an anachronism because Islam did not exist yet. Um, but because of his perceived denial of the Trinity and of Jesus' full divinity, like the, the Muslims, he was depicted as a Muslim. Anyway, here's a bishop slapping Arius, slapping Arius. Apparently, this bishop, this is at the Council of Nicaea, there's the story told that one of the bishops was so angered at the blasphemies that Arius was speaking about the Son, about Jesus uh, not being fully God and being created, that he got so angry, he went over and slapped him. Guess which bishop it is? You know him. You know him as Santa Claus. St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas of Myra, who is Santa Claus. Okay, that's what Santa Claus is short for, St. Nicholas. He was at the Council of Nicaea, and apparently, according to the story, he got mad at Arius and hit, slapped him across the face. Um, this was considered not an action that was becoming of a bishop to do, so he was um, given a penalty, so he could not wear the bishop's hat anymore. So sometimes in um, Eastern Catholic churches, Eastern Orthodox churches, you'll have, they're big on St. Nicholas, I don't know why, but you'll almost always find a picture of St. Nicholas up by the altar. And uh, a lot of times he's not wearing the bishop's hat, which he should be wearing if he were a bishop. And the explanation is that this is why, because he slapped Arius at the Council of Nicaea, which he shouldn't have done. It was an unchristian thing to do. So there's Santa Claus. Bring in the smack. Can you smell what St. Nicholas is cooking? Right, Mr. Grimaldi? <laughs> Anyways. Okay, so they, they write a creed, which is a statement of belief, which comes from the Latin word credo, which means I believe. And this creed was meant as a succinct explanation of doctrine, not a definition of something new. And the essential point to remember about this creed is this word, Greek word that they use, homoousios, homoousios, which you will not find in the Bible. And that was, again, a, a kind of a controversy amongst the bishops because they needed to find a word um, to describe the relationship of the son and the father um, but they couldn't really find any biblical terminology that fit, so they had to look more to philosophy, to human reason. And they came up with this word, or they took this word, homos and usia. Usia, homos means the same, and usia means nature, can also be translated, probably a better translation of usia for Greek is essence. So of one and the same essence, but I'll say nature here, okay? So the, the word is of one and the same nature as the Father. This had to be specific because some could say, well, Jesus is like the nature of the Father. And you'd still have to, maybe that distance between the Father and the Son. You know, Jesus is like God the Father. 
So maybe he's not fully God the Father, kind of opens the door for that. Um, the Arians would say, and some of the Arians would have said, he is unlike the Father in all things. So the, the, the count, bishops of the Council of Nicaea had to be kind of clear what they meant, um, or at least try to be. <laughs> at least try to be. Some historians, church historians, who look at this word homoousios, um, will will say that it's not actually clear what the word means. <laughs> it's, it's not actually clear, even to the Nicene bishops, because after Nicaea, they had like people like Athanasius and others had to keep explaining it. They had to keep, and even avoiding it sometimes, you know, but they had to keep explaining the word until it made sense to them. You know, uh, it, it says it might sound clear that Jesus is of one and the same nature as the Father, but a question could arise about um, how can you speak? How how is it possible to speak of equality between the Father and the Son without compromising the real distinction between them? Aren't you by saying Jesus is one and the same nature as the Father? Are you collapsing Jesus into the Father so that they're almost just one and the same thing? Or are they really distinct from each other, the Father and the Son? Because you use two different words to describe them. And their origins are different. Okay, the Father is not generated at all, but the Son is generated from the Father. So it, it answered the question. It didn't settle the dispute finally. Not everyone was happy, which just meant that more thinking needed to be done, which will be done, have to be done. What about the Holy Spirit? Talked about Jesus, but then the question becomes, well, what about this thing called a spirit, a Holy Spirit? The New Testament talks about a Holy Spirit or a spirit of God. For example, if you look at Matthew chapter 3, um, it uses both of those terms to describe this thing. Let's see what I was thinking of when I wrote that down in my notes. Uh, oh, yeah, it's uh, John the Baptist. Okay. Da, 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 da. Yeah, John the Baptist. And uh, John the Baptist, from our friend John the Baptist, he's baptizing people and he says, I baptize you. Um, with the Holy Spirit, there's some, I baptize you with water, but there's someone coming after me, meaning Jesus, apparently, who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus comes to John and is baptized in the Jordan River by John. And after Jesus comes out of the water, Jesus sees the Spirit of God descending like a dove. So this image of a bird, although the Holy Spirit is not literally a bird, doesn't become a bird. It's like a dove floating in the air. Okay, like a bird in the air is the image, the metaphor. Um, so this, the you know the uh, New Testament does talk about this thing called a spirit or or God. In Greek, the word used for this this thing is pneuma, pneuma, which in Greek means wind or breath anything air related, okay? And breath is like wind that comes in and out of our mouth. So, you know, pneuma means the wind or a breeze or any movement of air like the breath, like your breath. And sometimes in the Bible, the word spirit could just have the sense of God's power, his force, energy might be another way of describing it, which is non-material. And so, Spirit could substitute as another way of talking about God's powerful presence. And sometimes it seems to be used in this way. But at other times in the New Testament, it seems to indicate that the Holy Spirit is another being, another entity that is different from God the Father and from Jesus the Son. So this wind, quote unquote, or this breath, comes from the Father, but is not the Father himself. This spirit fills Jesus and empowers him, and he even promises to send the spirit to his followers, but is not Jesus himself. 
And then you have a few places like in 2 Corinthians, Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 3, verse 17, um, where Paul actually calls the Spirit the Lord. Okay, remember this, this title, Lord, um, is a divine title. It's, it's most commonly applied to God in, in the scriptures. And Paul uses it all over the place for Jesus. You know, Paul clearly thinks of Jesus as a divine figure. Um, but he also, in this one place, applies it to the Holy Spirit, interestingly enough. So he calls the Spirit the Lord. And in the book of Revelation, in the first, uh, in the beginning of the book of Revelation, in chapters two through three, there's a series of letters. There are these short letters that the author John is told to write to various churches. They're all in Turkey. Um, why, I don't know, but various churches in Turkey. Anyways, John writes these short letters in the name, in, in the person who's, who's telling John to do this is Jesus. Jesus tells John, write to the church in Thyatira, write to the church in Philadelphia, um, write to the church, what is another, what are one of the other churches? I forget the names of the churches, uh, Thyatira, I think Laodicea is another one. Anyways, write to the church. And at the end of the letter, it says, hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. So is it Jesus telling John to write the letters or is it the Holy Spirit? It seems like the Holy Spirit is speaking to the churches in the name of Christ. Many early Christians were willing to accept the divinity of Jesus, the fact that Jesus was God. They accepted that in faith but not of the Holy Spirit, okay? This one was difficult for some Christians. Um, they thought that the Holy Spirit was at least God's force and power, and at most a lesser, again, a lesser created divine being. So again, this is a question that comes up. If people believed in a Holy Spirit, but they didn't think about it very much. They didn't think about what its role was in salvation, or its relation to God was. You know, the church kind of treated the Holy Spirit as it, it was somehow connected to God, but wasn't necessarily totally clear that it was God. Until this man, St. <laughs> Gregory Nazianzen. St. Gregory Nazianzen. Who lived from around 329 to 390 A.D., and he was at part of actually a group of theologians. I'm just telling this one guy. There are actually two others, his brother, Basil, um, and his, oh no, um, his, uh, excuse me, his friend, Basil, a man named Basil, was his friend, and Basil's brother, another Gregory, Gregory of Nyssa, okay? So he's part of a group of theologians, these two dudes, or these two other guys, who um, were kind of like thinking about this issue and arguing about this issue. But out of the three of them, only St. Gregory Nazianzen would come forward and say, and kind of open this can of worms and say, look, the Holy Spirit is God. So that's his claim to fame. That's why he's important um, to the history of the Christian understanding of God. Um, you know, he, he wasn't saying anything new. They believed in a Holy, Christians believed in a Holy Spirit, but there was really a big question of Mark about the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And he's the first who says, look, you know, he just rips the Band-Aid off and says, look, we treat the Holy Spirit like it's God. Uh, we wouldn't do that if it wasn't God. So the Holy Spirit must be God too. And his argument, and one of probably one of the strongest arguments, I think, was was liturgical, was the worship of the church. Remember, part of sacred tradition is how the church prays, the liturgy. Remember when I went through the sources, you have councils, you have church fathers, we have liturgy. Well, Gregory is considered a church father, and he's also talking about the liturgy. How did the church treat the Holy Spirit in its worship? Um, for example, baptism. Jesus told his followers to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus names three things here, three beings, a Father, a Son, and a Holy Spirit. One name, though, it's not in the names of the Father and Son and Spirit as if there are three or uh, multiple things. There's a unity, and the, but there are three. 
and the Holy Spirit is one of them. So that was something that was significant to Gregory, the fact that the Holy Spirit is part of the sacrament of baptism. And for Gregory, sac, uh, baptism took away sins. It had a supernatural, we'll talk, we'll talk about this more when we talk about the sacraments of the church, but um, you know, the sacraments were not just merely symbols, they did things to the soul. So they restored the soul to grace, to God's um, blessing by removing sins. They recreated the soul and put it in relationship to God. And it's the Holy Spirit that does this. So if the Holy Spirit isn't God, it's just a tool or a power, then you're assigning God-like characteristics to something that's not God, because only God can recreate the soul, because God creates the soul. Only God can take away sins. And yet the Holy Spirit through baptism takes away sins. So he just followed through on the logic of the belief of what the Holy, he looked at what does the Holy Spirit do? If it acts, you know, if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, looks like a duck, it's probably a duck, you know? If the Holy Spirit is has divine characteristics and it's fully, it has to be fully divine, not some kind of second rate God. Um, okay. <laughs> so now that, uh, Now we're going to have to have another count. Oh, before I move on, I just wanted to mention, he's also given the nickname the theologian. So sometimes you'll see him called Gregory the theologian, Gregory of Nazianza. Okay, Gregory the theologian. Nazianza, oh, let me also, before I do, um, do leave him. The reason he's called Nazianza is because he was bishop of a place called Nazianzus, this little small two-horse town in Turkey that he never went to, it was, it, in fact, he was made bishop by Basil, his friend, because Basil, you know, kind of like ordained uh, Gregory, his friend, and Gregory of Nyssa, his brother, as bishop, because he thought that they would help him out and support him. And Gregory Nazianzen, like, came to this little town in the middle of nowhere. He looked at it, and it's like, it's like the meeting of two roads. There's nothing here. I'm out of here. You know? <laughs> and he left, and he would never go back. It was beneath him. You know, he's kind of snob in a way, but but a great theologian. So he's called Gregory the Theologian. Gregory of Nazianzus or Gregory Nazianzen. So there's going to have to be another council because this question starts to divide the church as well. <laughs> This council will be held in the city of Constantinople itself, which I showed you already, modern day Istanbul, um, again, convoked by the emperor, who at that time was Emperor Theodosius I, who reigned from 379 to 395, who was also a Christian. In fact, Theodosius, and this is a coin from his reign of Theodosius, this picture minted on the coin or printed on the coin, imprinted on the coin. Um, Theodosius is famous for actually making Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Constantine did not do that. Constantine, um, even though he became a Christian, he granted toleration to Christianity so that Christianity would no longer be persecuted and the church could, well, you know, they've got sort of legal rights like the church could own property, um, you know, stuff like that. And the main benefit was Christians would no longer be killed for not worshiping the Roman gods, gods of the state. Um, but uh, Theodosius is the one who, in 380, the year before this, made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. Okay? Sometimes people confuse this and say Constantine did it. He did not. Theodosius I did it, which, for good or for ill. <laughs> Because the church didn't seem to know how to handle its new power well, or at least didn't handle it very well. And, you know, when you get a lot of power, people can kind of lose their heads. And the church kind of did that afterwards. Anyways, but that's another cup of coffee. The Council of Constantinople. So the bishops meet in Constantinople to discuss this issue. Uh, this time there were 150 bishops that met all Eastern again. Um, the Pope, who was Damasus I, Pope St. Damasus, again, was not there, but he sent representatives. 
and they discuss the issue. And Constantinople, uh, the the arguments, for example, that theologians like Gregory of Nazianzen made, Gregory Nazianzen made, um, and others uh, carried the day. And of course, the popes were on the side of granting divinity to the Holy Spirit as well. Um, and, you know, in the minds of a lot of the bishops, is like we've always believed this. Did they always believe it, or they just now that they're thinking about it, they're like, well, yeah, we kind of always believed this. Uh, at least that's how we've been praying um, that the Holy Spirit is divine. So Constantinople defends the divine co-equality of the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son, and added, uh, you know, Nicaea had given a creed, a statement of faith that they issued out. Um, and Constantinople expands on that, and that's actually the creed that Christians use today. So, and I'll read it for you. Starts out, we believe in one God. All right, so the first thing that, and this is a combination of what the bishops wrote from Nicaea, which was shorter, and then the additions from Constantinople. Um, but we believe in one God. So from Nicaea, from the get-go, from the first opening statement, the, the bishops wanted to reaffirm their monotheism. There is only one God. What we're about to say here about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is not a denial of that fact, okay? It's an explanation of how God is, not what God is. God is not three. He is, he is one God, okay? So we believe in one God, not three gods. First, the Father, the all-powerful one, the maker of heaven and earth and of all things, both seen and unseen, those things that are visible, those things that are invisible. So they start out with the source of the Trinity in a way, okay, which is the Father. And we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ. If you read this, you'll notice they never say Jesus is God. It's never explicit, nor with the Holy Spirit interestingly enough, even though that's what they're kind of getting at by calling Jesus the Lord, and that there's one Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one Son of the Father, not multiple sons. So there's one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. So you see they use that language of producing like a father produces, right? Um, which God, that's why God is called the Father. And when I think about it, um, talk about that. Am I going to go down a rabbit hole if I talk about that? Um, no, I guess I'll go there. Um, well, maybe I will, because it might be. Why? Well, I guess I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but maybe I should mention it. Why is God called father and not mother or just any other word and stuff like that? Why is it using this language of begetting and, and this father from a son? And I think the reason for this is because it shows the that remember, God is purus actus. He is pure act of being. Right? He is activity. He's not possibility. And I think that's where maybe the difference, even though it's unspoken, there's a difference there between the male and the female aspects. Okay, Because God is beyond sex. I mean, God is immaterial. He doesn't have sexual organs. So he doesn't produce eggs and he doesn't produce sperm. So he's, he's not a gendered thing like we are in some ways. Um, but in the creation of a human being, the female can be seen as the place of possibility. A woman could be pregnant or not be pregnant. Sometimes she produces eggs and is fertile, and sometimes the, her body doesn't. There's possibility there. Okay. Whereas with the, the male, they notice that they always produce sperm. And the sperm is active because the sperm has to be passed into the body of the woman. It has to even journey, physically journey to the egg, to the ovum that's in the woman, which is just waiting for, um, for the, uh, the sperm to get there, if they can get there, hopefully if they're healthy sperm. Um, so there's that idea of activity. Remember, God is active. He's actuality. So I think that there's, there is a reason why... Christianity, even though they didn't know the biology, but we know we know more of the biology that, than they do. And um, certainly this was not a discussion during Nicaea with the bishops, but I think that that's something that they're getting at 
getting at, because in other religions, there is a mother goddess, there is a fe female gods, which might be the representations of gods as possibility, but that's not the idea of the Judeo-Christian God, which is pure action, action, and his action is to exist. So the son is the only begotten of the father before all time, so before all ages, light from light, true God from true God. Here, notice they've incorporated some subordinationist language, light from light, but like the rays of the sun, but they've reinterpreted it now. They've told you this is how it should be interpreted properly. You know, a ray of light that comes from the sun is truly part of the sun. It's truly of the nature of the sun. So they're, they're kind of reinterpreting it from a subordinationist perspective, which might see a ray of light as a lesser part of the sun. They know it's fully part of the sun from which it comes, the, the object of the sun from which it comes. Um, you could also use the image of like a stream going out from a river. You know, it's, it's the same water that's going out into the stream from the same river. Um, I mean, these, these metaphors and simile, uh, these similes are imperfect, of course, because they're physical and God is not physical but they do help us to understand something. He is true God from true God. So here, actually, I gotta contradict myself. He is kind, he is called God here. There is a, uh, I guess you could say it's an oblique reference. It's not saying he is, but it is kind of saying he's the true God from the true God, okay? Again, begotten, not made, which sounds repetitive, but they wanna make the point that Jesus is not a creature. So this is against Arius' view that Jesus is created, okay? Um, Consubstantial, I'll end with this, consubstantial, and the Greek word homoousion with the Father, that's where this comes into play, the homoousios. He is, could you translate this as one in the same essence with the Father? Yeah, maybe. In the current translation, they prefer to use this word consubstantial, um, you know, which literally is kind of like together with the substance of the Father, okay, which kind of has the same meaning if you understand it correctly. Um, but nevertheless, we know what homoousion literally means, so we understand how to understand it correctly. So he is consubstantial with the Father through whom all things came to be. God created through the Son, created the world through the Son. He's the instrument of creation. He is not a creature of creation. Okay, I'll end here and uh, finish up, uh, continue on on Tuesday. Good to see you all. God bless you all. Remember, there's a quiz tomorrow. Quiz tomorrow. Da -da 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 -da. Have a good day, miss. Thank you. Thank you.